To properly understand how the Underground Railroad worked, we first have to know what caused it, and that is slavery. Slavery's history spans many cultures, nationalities, and religions from ancient times and unfortunately still today. From all the enslavement periods throughout history, perhaps one is the most noticeable, the 246 years of slavery in the USA. The starting point of slavery in America was in 1619 when 20 enslaved Americans were brought to the British colony of Virginia. Over the following decades, hundreds of thousands of people were sold or kidnapped from Africa and shipped to 13 colonies, then forced into slavery. After the American Revolutionary War, some northern states abolished slavery, while the southern states had an economy built on it because the south had a perfect climate and available land to grow crops like rice, sugarcane, tobacco, and cotton. Until 1850, the balance was kept between the free states and the slave states, but after half of the 19th century, the situation tilted the balance in the favor of the Union because these five states joined the U.S. But for the purpose of this video, we are going to look at what an enslaved African American's life was like in the year of 1850, when the balance was still maintained. Back then, he didn't have many choices in life. He could remain on his owner's plantation, work six days a week from sunrise to sunset, regarding himself to a life of harsh and painful labor, barbaric physical punishment, and possibly a broken family as he watched his loved ones be sold away. Not all enslaved people had the same life, but this is what he might expect if he remained in bondage or he could try and run away, but escaping was anything but easy. So, due to hard labor and punishments, an enslaved individual decides to leave. The closer he is to the border between the free states and the slave states, the easier it is. This is why from the estimated 100,000 people who escaped through the Underground Railroad, many of them were from the border states, because the journey was much shorter and safer, and it was thought, once they arrived north, they were free. On the other hand, African Americans from the South had way longer journeys until the North, and probably many of them didn't even know the free states existed. As an enslaved individual, knowing how to read or write was a crime. So without any maps, not knowing where to head, escaping alone was very difficult. That being said, this is where the Underground Railroad comes into the story. As the name says, this route was made of many underground ghost train stations that led to the far north, even Canada. Or at least that's what the myth says. In reality, it was neither underground nor a railroad, but a secret network which was not run by a single organization or person. It was run by both black and white people, who tried rescuing individuals to the far north. The system had a well-defined structure, and certain people had certain roles, whose names were coded, so masters and owners of enslaved people wouldn't be aware of this secret route. It is believed that the Underground Railroad was created shortly before the beginning of the 19th century by abolitionists, many of whom lived in Pennsylvania. Many abolitionists, or people who were enslaved, but escaped on their own, joined the network. One of the most important roles in the system was the agent, who was a person that went to plantations to try and help the enslaved ones escape by telling them to meet at a certain time near the plantation with a conductor, who was a guide. Here, the first issue comes into the equation. What if no agent came? In this case, they had to escape on their own. But remember, they didn't have any maps, and most of them were illiterate. So without some outside help, this was very unlikely. But at least they had songs, as they were transmitted from generation to generation and contained hints that helped the escapees go north. So they were something like musical maps. Lyrics from Follow the Drinking Gourd are a guide for people who wanted to escape, and even the title means Follow the North Star. So, if the enslaved is alone, that's kind of the only thing that helps him. He had to leave at night and travel until the sunrise, rest in the day, and then again, when night came, follow the North Star and moss on trees to go north and hope for the best. Although going alone was not the best option, if one wanted to escape from bondage, he had to go on his own or wait for an agent to come. But he wouldn't know if somebody would ever try and rescue him. And if somebody came, how could the enslaved individual know if the supposed agent was trustworthy? All right, now let's imagine that a true agent came. Now what's next? Generally, agents usually pretended to be enslaved to enter plantations and tell the others the date when they would have to escape. The perfect time would have been on a clear night on Saturday, because masters would have to wait until Monday morning to place an announcement in the newspaper that one escaped. The best season to try and escape was late fall or early winter because the longer the nights, the more ground the escapees could cover. Groups couldn't be too big because they could be easily spotted. After the meeting point and time were set, they had to wait, act normally, and when the night came, leave. At the meeting point, they would find the conductor, where they will change the clothes because back then a group of African American people with dirty clothes would look very suspicious. Then the guide would lead them through the night until the first station, which was 10 to 20 miles away. In case you didn't realize yet, each of the roles involved in the system had coded names that would have normally been used in a railroad system. The cargo, or the escapees, will wait at a station, which is owned by a station master, who is the owner of the safe house until the next conductor will come to move the cargo further north. 
To reduce the risk of infiltration, many people associated with the Underground Railroad knew only their part of the operation and not of the whole scheme. This process was repeated many times until the escapees finally arrived in the free states, where they could enjoy freedom and never be enslaved again. Wait, what's that? It's the year 1850, and the Second Fugitive Slave Act passed? This basically encouraged capturing escapees and sending them back to the South. The penalties were harsher for people who hid fugitives, but it also created controversy. A free African-American black man in the North could be considered an escapee, therefore he could get enslaved and be sent to the South. A Fugitive Slave Act was previously passed in 1793, but this second one made many escapees go even further north, to Canada, or how it was called by enslaved individuals in the South, Heaven, or the Promised Land. There they could avoid US jurisdiction and slavery wasn't a thing there, although racism still existed. Black people who were once enslaved formed communities, and men had the right to vote and the right to own property. All black people could earn a living, get married, and start a family. With assistance from Canada's government and abolitionist societies in Canada and the United States, building a new life was possible. But for some this wasn't enough. They wanted to help. Some became conductors and went back to the South to try and free their friends and relatives. One of the most courageous and famous people during these times was Harriet Tubman. Between 1850 and 1860, Tubman made 19 trips from the North to the South following the Underground Railroad and set free hundreds of enslaved people. Slavery was one of the primary causes of the American Civil War, and both the victory of the Union and the passage of the 13th Amendment in 1865 ended slavery in the United States forever. And with it, the Underground Railroad became history.